So uh, two thirds of the class is going to continue. Of this lecture is going to be on file systems, the continuation of where we left off last time, and the last third we will do a review for exam two. Okay, so let's start with file system. This is the picture I put up last time. Okay, so I said this is the file system component in the kernel. Okay, layered bottom is at the very bottom. We have the hardware. In this case, we are just looking at disks, but it could be any storage device, USB disks, CD ROMs, SSD drives, solid state drives, magnetic drives, tape drives, doesn't matter, but it's all storage devices. Then you have the low layer, so at the very top, your applications, and then what sits in between is what is inside the kernel. So there are two layers in there. This is the interface that the kernel is exporting to application. This is the file system interface for uh, accessing any storage uh, data. And then you have the lower level interface that allows the kernel to actually uh, read or write data to storage devices. Okay, so, so we last time we spent a little bit of time talking about this file system interface. Okay? Open, close, how do you read a file, write a file. We looked at this notion of directories and so on. Okay, today we are going to look at the lower level interface. I'm going to start with how disks work. And then we look at how storage should be organized on this. Okay. As far as some of the inter actual interface is concerned, we will wait until we start looking at I/O devices because that is material that is also part of device drivers. Okay. So, so we want to actually look at how the kernel is communicating with your disk or a, a set or, or a SCSI or a bus or anything like that. Okay. So this is what we will start with. So. Let's start with uh, so understanding of how disks work. Okay, so I presume you know a uh, little bit about this, but if not, I will explain in more detail. Okay, so I got some disks just to show you. Uh, if you haven't seen what a hard disk looks like. So this is a typical hard disk that is in a uh, PC class device. Okay, 3.5 inch disk, okay, and I'll, sh I'll talk about what is inside this disk, okay, but that's what it looks like. If you have a laptop, then you have a disk that's smaller. <coughs> and this is essentially the same thing, but a 2.5 inch disk. Okay. The USB is a 2 or 2.5. That's 2.5 inch disk. Okay. So you see that shrunk quite a bit. Okay. And if you have a solid state disk, that's so what you have in iPods and iPads and kind of from this. Uh, it's even smaller. Yeah, you can probably see this through the bubble wrap, but it's even smaller. But it's 1.8 inch. Right? So you'll see that the form factor is actually shrinking. Okay? Uh, the technology is also changed. Okay? So these are traditional magnetic disk drives, and I'll show you this as a picture of it here. These are solid state disk, no moving parts. Okay? This is like your flower. Uh, SD card that you stick into a camera or a tablet or a phone. The okay, same technology is now in disk drives. Okay. So let's try to understand what disks uh, uh, look like on the inside. Okay. So the way to the best way to explain it is what is in this disk is essentially very similar to what you see on a CD or a DVD. Okay. So you have what are called platters. Okay. So each platter looks like a CD, okay. and data is recorded on those platters. And this is basically how data is organized on a platter of a disk. Okay? Typically, what, what you see if you actually open this up, okay? uh, right now you have to unscrew this, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, you'll see that there may be 8 to 10 of these platters. So think of it as a stack of uh, DVDs or CDs that are actually stacked in there. Each of that is a recording surface, each of that can store data. Okay? But as far as each surface is concerned, it looks somewhat like what a CD or is organized somewhat like what a CD or DVD uh, is organized. So you have what are called data is recorded in cir circles. Okay? So each of these circles or circle is called a track. Okay? Not to be confused with music tracks, these are data tracks. Okay? Uh, so, so a track is where you store bits and each track is partitioned into sectors. Okay? So each of these things is just called a sector. A sector is the smallest uh, unit of data that you can read or write from a disk or a CD. Okay? You cannot read any uh, any bits that are smaller than that. So typical sector sizes may be 512 bytes in size. Okay? 
Okay, so that's the minimum amount of uh, data that you can read or write. And the way you actually go about reading or writing is there is a disk head. Okay, so I should have gotten a CD to illustrate this. But let's assume that you have a platter. Yeah, I think you have to assume this is a circle. And you have a disk head, and this, this thing is spinning. Right? The whole platter is actually spinning. There's a motor that spins it, and the disk head can position, it moves back and forth, and it can position itself to on any track. Okay, so this disk head can move back and forth, and this thing is spinning, and it positions itself on any track. And then when the right sector spins under the head, it can read or write. Okay? So the way you actually read or write this uh, to this device is you say, tell the disk, go to track 35 and read sector 15. And then what this disk head will do is it will see where it's positioned and then move, either move back and forth until it goes to track 35. Okay? Once it's positioned on that track, it has to wait for the right sector to spin underneath the track. And once it's underneath the head, excuse me, and once the right sector is positioned under it and as it spins by, you read or write bits to it. Okay? It's important to understand how disks work because we will come back and see how to optimize the layout of uh, data, as far as the file system is concerned, how to optimize the layout of data on these disks. Okay. So a few things you should consider, or if you not consider, remember, is that the data is organized into concentric circles. Okay. Each circle uh, is referred to as a track, okay. and the tracks are partitioned into sectors. Okay. And then basically that's a minimum granularity of data that you can read or write to a magnetic disk. Okay. This is how traditional disk drives are work. As far as uh, if you switch to solid state disks, completely different technology. We'll come back to solid state disks next time, or maybe the class after. When we talk about RAID, we'll talk about all these other technologies. Okay? But this is how disks have uh, uh, worked for a long time. Okay? That is changing, and soon we probably won't see any of these disks as SSDs take over. But for now, we still have to worry about them. So now, if you try to think about uh, reading or writing data, there is going to be some overhead. So I, we have kept saying disks are slow. Okay? We said memory is fast, disks are slow. We have to ask why is that? Okay? So let's try to understand that. So as I said, if you want to read any sector from this disk, you have to first take the disk head and move it to the right location. That is the right track. Okay? And then you have to wait for the disk head, the right sector to spin underneath the head, and then you can read or write. So what this says is there is going to be always an overhead to do an I.O. to this, which means there's going to be latency incurred before any useful work can happen. And there are two kinds of overheads. The first one is referred to as the seek type, and the second overhead is what is called a rotational latency. Okay, I will draw a picture here so I don't have to keep going back and forth. Okay, let's assume that's the disk head, okay? and this is the track you're interested in reading. And maybe you want to read that chapter. This is the disk head at this point. Okay. So first you have to move this disk head. So this disk head moves back and forth and this matter is spinning. Okay. So the first later, the seek time is the time that takes this disk head to move itself and, and position itself on the right track. So it is going to move forward and eventually it is going to arrive at the right track. Okay. And this latency is referred to as the seek time. Okay. The time position the disk head or the right cylinder or track okay, for this class they are synonymous. Okay? And once you have positioned it uh, the, on the right track, you are still not done. Okay? The data you are trying to read is here, but the disk head is positioned here, so you have to wait for the entire platter to spin so that this data actually appears here. Okay? And then once it is positioned and it is spinning by, you can read. Okay? That's the rotational latency, the time for the correct sector to rotate under the disk head. Okay. Until this point, nothing useful has happened. You are just trying to position the disk so that it can do some useful work. Okay. Typical latencies for these seek times and rotational latencies are in the orders of a few milliseconds or tens of milliseconds. Okay. It's not unusual to have a 10 millisecond seek and a 10 millisecond rotational latency. Okay. So for each I.O. operation, if you are paying tens of milliseconds of overhead, just to get the disk to the right location, nothing useful has happened in the meantime. And that's a long time. You can imagine, uh, compare that to a quantum duration of 100 milliseconds. Okay? You're wasting 10, 20% uh, 
of our entire time slide <coughs> of just doing IO that we won't be running on the CPU, but you can see where the overheads come from, why disk is slow. Compare that to memory speeds which are in the order of micro or nanoseconds. Here we are talking about millisecond overheads. Okay, a thousand uh, times higher overheads. Okay. And once you position the disk, then you can read or write, and the speed at which you can read or write is dependent on the speed of the interface, whether it's a SATA interface or a SCSI interface or a USB. This drive will depend, will govern what is the speed at which you can actually read data off the track and send it to the machine. Okay. So all of the file system optimizations that we are going to study are going to try to lay out data on this so that we reduce these overheads. Okay. The more seek and rotational latency overheads you are going to incur, the worse your performance is going to be. Okay. Because as I said, that's wasted time. You're not doing any useful reading or writing. You're just positioning the disk. Okay. So if you come out with intelligent layout on disk, layout of data on disk, so that this overhead is minimized, you are going to see better IO performance. Okay. So all of the file system uh, material that we are going to look at today is going to worry about how do you optimize this overhead. Okay, is that clear? Okay. Now I'm going to just say one more <coughs> thing here before moving on. So all of these optimizations that we'll see are valid for magnetic disk drives. Okay, these are the disk drives where the platters are spinning and so on. If you actually switch to solid state disk, none of these overheads exist. A solid state disk is effectively a random access device. There's no moving part here. You just ad directly address block, saying give me block 25, and you just read block 25. This is exactly like your address memory. So you can just say, go to add this location in the memory, this address in memory, and read a word from it. Same kind of stuff. So file systems that you have designed to work for, or optimize for magnetic disks, don't necessarily perform well when you switch to solid status. Okay, you actually have to change the un underlying layout, because as a, the technology has changed. So you'll see the file systems will work fine, but the optimization won't buy you anything. So they're not meant for this technology. Okay. So keep that in mind. So all of the optimizations are only valid for traditional magnetic disks, not for solid state disks. Okay. So this is another picture of what I was just saying already. Uh, so this is what, what is inside a disk. As I said, it's a sequence of platters. There's one head per platter. Okay, this head moves back and forth, all the platters are spinning. At any given time, you can actually read or write from one of the platters. You can't read or write in parallel. That's not allowed because there's only one bus going down. So you can pick any of these platters and position your head on the right track on that platter and the right sector and read or write from that location. Okay? So the way you're going to address the disk is you're going to say go to platter I track J sector K. Okay, so that you'll pick one of these platters and then you'll pick a track on that platter and you'll pick a sector on that track. And this is how you're going to address new I.O. on disks. Okay, anything that I can clarify before we move on? This is just a brief primer on how disks work, the hardware stuff. Okay, so now, that's why I Basically, we have to talk about file system. So let's move back to what the file system is. So as far as the file system is concerned, okay, it actually doesn't know anything about the layout on disk yet. Okay, the way it is the, uh, addressing data is it's using logical address. Just as we had logical memory addresses and physical memory addresses, the same kind of concept is true here. So basically, you will have file, uh, file numbers and blocks within a file. So as far as the file system is concerned, it's like go to file 10 and read the 15th block of that file. Okay? Somewhere you have to keep some data, or not data, some tables that map files and blocks to particular sectors on disk. You have to say, okay, file 0, block 1 maps to platter 4, cylinder 3, sector 8. Okay, cylinder is same as a track. So this mapping has to be maintained somewhere. Okay? So, so if once you know that, and if you get a read request for this block, the device driver will actually translate that to a read request for that sector. And this, this is the translation you will do, do from the file layer to the underlying disk. Now as far as file system performance is concerned, last time if you remember I talked about sequential and random access. We need a layout on disk that will allow us to provide good performance 
for applications that are accessing files in sequence as well as ones that access data randomly on this. When okay. you want to ask the question, what is the right data structure to maintain file information and how we lay out these files on this? Okay. So we'll talk about that one at a time. Okay. So first of all, what we have to understand is as far as the file system is concerned, there are two key aspects that the file system needs to worry about, which is what we call data and metadata. Okay, so data is what is actually the, the files themselves, what is in the files. Metadata is additional bookkeeping information that the file system maintains about each file. Okay, ownership of the file, what's the size of the file, where are the blocks on the file stored on disk, all of that information for each file is stored in meta in what's called the metadata of each file. Okay, so, so here the metadata we refer to as the file descriptor. Right? And they have been given different names. In Unix uh, file systems, they are called inodes. Okay, in some other file system, they have been given different names. We use a generic term, which is a file descriptor, for referring to metadata. Right? So we have to worry about what is the, the structure we use for the file descriptor and what is in the file descriptor, how does it track where the files are stored and so on and so forth. Okay? That's the first thing. The second issue that we need to worry about as far as file systems are concerned is the types of files you are going to see on a disk. Okay? If you take a typical PC or a laptop and examine the actual files that are stored on that disk, you'll see the following characteristics. Okay? You'll see that most files are small. Okay? The average size of a typical file on disk is a few kilobytes, three to four kilobytes. Okay? So most files are small. The majority of files are very small. The majority of the disk space is taken by a very small number of very large files. Okay? This is also called heavy tail behavior, if you heard the term heavy tail. Okay? So most of the space taken by a very small number of files. So you may have large music files, or you may have created a video file, or you may have lots of images you've taken on the camera. Those are consuming most of the space, but those are a relatively small number of the total files. You may have up to 100,000 files on a typical disk. Okay? Your media files, in this case, those are the large files, are probably a small fraction in terms of overall number. But in terms of overall space, they consume most of the space. Okay? Most files are small, most disk space is taken by large files. You want to support I.O. operations on both small and large files. Okay? Whether it's a Java program you wrote that's three kilobytes in size, or a one hour DVD video that you downloaded and are viewing, you want to provide efficient access to both. Okay? So the per file cost must be low, but large files must also have good performance. Okay? So now you have to design a file system that can accommodate all of these characteristics. Okay? By file system we need, we mean you need to design what the file descriptor looks like, what the layout on this looks like for each file. Is that clear? Any questions on this? Okay. So we'll start with some simple uh, file system and then we'll build it up from there. So the first one is just we'll do the same stuff we did in memory allocation. We'll say, let's assume that files are stored contiguously on disk. Okay. So what does that mean? So, so the OS of the file system maintains a list of free blocks or free sectors. Whenever you want to create a new file, you basically take a contiguous chunk of sectors and you say this, this is where this file is going to be stored. Yes, well, as far as this platter is concerned, let's say you want to store a uh, one kilobyte file, so you, and each sector is half a kb file, like one byte. You're going to find two contiguous free sector and say this is where the file is going to be stored. That's the first block or the first sector of the file, that's the second block of the file. Okay. And that's, that's it. So files are contiguous, and you basically have to maintain a free list of all the sectors and find enough contiguous sectors to accommodate that file, and you are done. Yeah, as far as this file system is concerned. Okay, so as far as the file descriptor is concerned, all you need to do is store two bits of information in addition to the file level ownership and so on. What you will have to do is the start location and the size. So file descriptor says this file foo okay, starts at this track and this sector number and there's two sectors inside. Yes, and that's all you need to do. 
track down that file. So if, if you have an editor that says, oh, open this file, you just look at the start location, that's the start address on this, and the size, and you know where the file is to be read through. Okay, very simple policy. Okay. Now, you go on the other side, very simple. So you can ask, okay, what is the overhead of accessing this file? Okay, if I, if I send in a request to uh, read the whole file, what kind of seeks and rotational latency overhead am I going to see? Okay. You're asking? Yes. Mm -hmm. Probably one seek and one rotation, honestly. So to read this entire file, the overheads are going to be, you say, go to the start location of the file. So you're going to seek to that track. And then you're going to say, wait for the start location to spin by, and then just read I sectors, and I is the size of the number of blocks in the file. Okay. So one seek, one rotation, and then some number of sectors. Okay, that's the transfer time. Okay. So that's basically the access overhead of this kind of organization. That okay. many disadvantages, of course. First is Files are not going to be static. Okay. Files will grow and shrink. <coughs> you are writing some source code, you may add some text, you may delete some size. The size of the file keeps fluctuating. If you have contiguous allocation, you have the same problem. If you then put another file right next to it, and this file grows, then you have no space. Then you have to copy that data somewhere else, and that increases the overhead. Okay. So changing file sizes poses a problem. Okay. And you have fragmentation again. So we are back to this frag fragmentation problem because files are of different sizes. As you create and delete files, you will leave holes on this and you have a fragmentation. You may have external fragmentation where there are lots of holes, but no hole is big enough to accommodate a large file. Okay? So those are the disadvantages. Now, as it turns out, although this might seem like a very uh, naive approach, it is widely used, even today. And the reason it is widely used is there are certain classes of disks where it works out okay. These are write-only disks, right? not write-only, write-ones. Write-only is the case. Write-ones, you just write, don't read. <laughs> it should be write-ones, read many disks. Okay? Namely, CDs and DVDs. Okay? These are what things that you are going to burn. The file size doesn't change on the DVD. Once you burn the DVD or CD, you are done. So if you want to burn a CD or DVD, you take all the files, you lay them out contiguously, and you just burn the thing, and you're done. Yeah, after that, you don't have to, the thing is going to change for you. Yeah, and this is as good as it gets. It's very simple. There's not much organizational stuff to deal with. You only have to say, this file begins at this location. That's the size of the file. And you just read it continuously. Okay? So, so it's still widely used for us. So if you have any CD-ROM, DVD, the file system there basically uses this organization. Okay, now needless to say, early uh, operating systems use this organization no longer because this doesn't work for general purpose disks. Okay, but for special cases like uh, uh, write ones, read many, worm devices. Okay, so th this works fine. Okay. The first, that was the first approach. Second approach linked files. Okay, so basically what you do is you keep a list of free sectors. Okay, this, so you say these are all the sectors on the disk. Files are no longer have to be continuous. We are going to make a files as linked list on a disk. Okay, so basically you say this is the file descriptor. Okay, you keep a pointer to the head. Okay, the pointer basically says the first block of the disk of uh, the file is platter 4 cylinder 20 sector file. That is this data block. Okay. And then you store some data and you keep the last byte as a pointer to the next chunk of the file, the next sector, and so on and so forth. Okay? So you have an address to the next block here, and that's data in the file, that's the second block, and then you have an address and so on. So it's really a linked list okay, as far as the file is concerned. And the file descriptor only has to store the, the head of the list and the size of the linked list, namely how many blocks there are. Data doesn't have to be contiguous. Yeah, because you can just have linked list and this blocks of sectors can be spread anywhere on this block. So you have one sector here, it will have a pointer to another one there. So you have another sector here, it will have a pointer here and so on. Okay? 
So let's try to understand what are the pros and cons of this organization. Yes. Um, well, you're going to have to seek one time for each uh, sector in, in the worst case. You have to seek once for each block of data you read. And you may have to rotate for each block of data. So if it's scattered, if these are scattered all over the disk, we may have to have a seek to a different track and then a, a rotation rate for each block. Right. Um, and if I want this may be kind of an edge case, but if I want to just read in the last block of data, I can't do that because I don't have a point at the beginning of the file, so I have to go track down all of the other blocks of data before I can figure out where the last one is. So if I just want the last, you know, 500 lines of that 20 megabyte log file, I have to go read the rest of the thing anyway. Okay. So you have something to add to that? It's also a growing problem because if you have a file that you write to continuously, like the log file, it'll eventually scatter itself all across the drive. Okay. So it's file is scattered. Uh, it eliminates so external fragmentation if you use the standard block size. Okay. So one advantage to people don't like it, one person likes it. Okay, so no external fragmentation. <laughs> So clearly, external fragmentation is gone because the data doesn't have to be continuously laid out. You can just find any sec free sector. If you want to grow the file, find some free sector somewhere and just put a pointer in the last block to that block and you have added one block to the file. <laughs> Files can grow and shrink without having to be continuous. External fragmentation gone. Okay? The, the caveat, as was mentioned, is this uh, size of this block has to be so either a sector or some multiples of a sector. And let's assume it's just one sector. Okay? No external fragmentation, a good advantage. This advantage, as was pointed out, uh, to read, uh, read this file, okay? to read, uh, so, so if you look at the contiguous allocation, you said to read it, you have to do one C, one rotational latency, and then you just read the next N sectors, uh, which are stored continuously. Okay? Now, if you have an N block file, here you will potentially have N seeks. N rotational latencies and N transfers. Because okay. each of this is stored at different locations, so you will go and say seek to the, this block, and then you will move the head there, you read it, and you will see where is the next block. You will actually take this pointer and say now seek to this block. Okay. So that each of these blocks is going to trigger a seek, okay. and then and rotational latency. Okay. And as I said, seeks and rotational latencies are wasted over here. Yeah, so we have significantly increased the overhead just to read the file sequentially. Okay, so sequential performance is significantly slower than contiguous allocation. And there, as was pointed out, random performance is even worse. If you just say, go read the ith block, that's the only block I care about. Okay? You don't know the address of the ith block, you only know the address of the first block. So you actually have to traverse this link list to actually get to the nth block. You have to read all this data, and the, more the further out this block is, the more data you are reading. So you are actually re traversing the link list until you get to the IF block. Right? So essentially, random access is a sequential scan. Right? Not good from a performance perspective in this question. Well, where is the link list stored? Where is the link list stored? This is what is actually stored on disk. Okay. Right? This is a so block on disk. The last byte of that block is actually a pointer. It stores the address. This, this address is actually stored in the last byte of that block, the sector. So you now know the address of the next block. This is so. If you the file 12 bytes, think of this file 11 bytes of data. One byte metadata it stores pointers. So there's no like abstraction of this stored in like cache or something. There is no cache. This is what is on disk. Okay. Once you read the data in cache, you can cache it in memory and so on. But reading it is going to be slow. So random performance is not great. Okay. Now, I, I'll, so again, as I said, although this might look like a naive organization, there are file systems that use this. Okay. DOS had <coughs> file systems, or FAT files, early FAT file systems actually use this organization. Okay. So basically, they used to be a linked list. Okay. Some versions of FAT still do some variant of this. Okay. So 
uh, random performance is uh, random access rather is as bad performance. Sequential access is not bad, but it has n seats, uh, one seat per per block that you need to read. Okay. So we already answered all of this. Fragmentation is gone. File size changes easily handled. You can insert blocks in the middle by tweaking pointers and and so on. Uh, efficiently supports, well, it's not efficient, but it supports sequential access uh, with n six and n rotation. Random access is not directly supported. You have to essentially scan in order to get to a particular block, number of seeks you have to talk Fat file systems use this organization. Okay. The only good part of this is all the entire free blocks on the file is essentially one large file that looks exactly the same as any other file. Okay, so if you want to keep a list of all the free blocks on disk, all you have to do is create a one long link list of all the free sectors. Okay. So if you want to then get a new free block, you just take go to the head of the list, take this is a free block. You just basically take it out of this free block file and then move the head to the next one. If you want to delete a file, you take that entire file and just put it at, at the beginning of this list. Okay, so in deletions, and uh, growing files are not bad because the free block is also has the same organization as valid files on this, the free block list. Okay. Any questions on this? Yes. If you, okay, so if you put all of the free space into a linked list, is the arrangement of that space arbitrary or is it sequential? Okay, that's a good question. If you put it on that linked list, is the arrangement arbitrary or sequential? Over time, it is going to become arbitrary. Okay. You can do recompaction where you reorganize this because it might be the case that two sectors, adjacent sectors are both free, but because they were assigned to different file, one sector is at the beginning of this list and the other one at the end. So even though you may have two adjacent sectors, you can't even do simple optimizations like put two sectors next to one another in the same file. It will actually save you one seek when you try to read adjacent blocks. So over time, this will this list will get fragmented, but you can of course defragment it by sorting all the blocks in the free list. That will give you some better performance. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So what the other thing I should mention is the reason sometimes you can undelete files on uh, I mean, once you delete files, but if you run some utilities, they can undelete files. As many many a time, the file is actually not deleted. You just take it from the file descript and just stick it onto the free list. The entire linked list is still preserved, it's just sitting there on the free list. Yes, if you want to undelete it, you can actually go and look at what is in the file and just take that chunk of that, layer, that section of the linked list and take it out and restore your file. Okay, this is how some uh, uh, file restoration utilities used to work. Yes, question. So when you delete the file descriptor, the pointer is still there? The head, when you delete the file descriptor, you just wipe this out and you just zero this out. But this entire link list is just good. You take it and you stick it on the free block list. So all the data is still there, you won't erase the data. So if you actually go and figure out that those are the blocks of the file, you can recover all the file. Yeah, because the structure is intact. Unless you have already allocated some portions of those sectors to other files, uh, it will still be sitting there. You can it. So neither of these organizations actually we really like continuous allocation only for well for CDs, not for general purpose file system. This organization not great for random access. Okay, so we need a better one. So we are going to use an indexed organization, okay, so which is uh, indexed files. So here what we have is a file descriptor, which is a table of pointers. So let's say this table has 10 entries. As, for, as an example, the first entry has the address of the first block, the second entry has the address of the second block, the third entry has the address of the third block, and so on. So when you open the file, you first read this file descriptor. Okay? And then you basically if you want to access the ith block, you just look at the ith entry, you get the address and you go read it. Okay? So essentially this is a table of disk pointers, not memory pointers, this is a table of disk for each. So these are addresses of disk blocks. These are so the ith entry here points to the ith block on disk for that file. Is that clear? Yes. So this index the, the reason 
you call this index file, this basically this is an index of this pointer. And uh, in Unix terminology, this is called this file descriptor is called an index node for this very reason because it stores the index of this block pointer. So now if you understand this, let's ask the question, what can we say about the performance of this organization and pros and cons? Do uh, we need uh, NC time and then rotational delay and all those things? Okay, NC and rotational delay. Do you have something else? Um, uh, just to that, but also there are, but you do get good random access performance here. Okay. So, for sequential access, you basically just look at the first block, send off an IO request for that address, so you look at the second. So. And since the blocks no longer have to be continuous, like in the linked list, blocks are not continuous. Blocks will be scattered on this. You will have n seeks and n rotational latencies. So you need n blocks of a file. But unlike the linked list organization, random access is efficient because the address of the ith block is in the file descriptor. It's not <coughs> actually in the file itself. Okay, so you just look at the ith entry here and you know the address and you just go read. Okay, so to read the ith block, you have basically two disk IOs. The first one to read the file descriptor, and the second one to read the block once you read the ith entry. Okay. Second. The primary disadvantage would be it must be declared file size before it's created and potentially can't grow. But couldn't you just make the last pointer point to another index node? Okay. Good point. So I was going to say, what about files growing and shrinking? So, as you can imagine, okay, the number of entries in this file index determines the size of the file. If there are i entries, you can have i blocks in the file. Okay, because that means you can only store addresses of i there, i disk blocks. If, you want, if the file grows to i plus one, this organization by itself won't handle it. You have to somehow make this organization dynamic. So either you say, I limit the size of the file to n blocks, and n can be a large number, and for every file I, I allocate a descriptor with n entries. So let's say n is 1000 blocks. And I basically, every time I create a file, I create a file descriptor in an array of 1000 entries. And then basically I, have, I can accommodate this maximum file size that are declared up front. If you want to make the file bigger than that, it won't grow to that. Okay, but the disadvantage of it is twofold. The first one is, of course, as I said, most files are small. There are a few kilobytes in size. So you may have a very large file descriptor with mostly empty entries. Okay, so you're wasting this space to store large empty file descriptors, or mostly empty file descriptors. The first problem. Second problem is, how do you decide what n is? n better be very large to accommodate most needs. A DVD is like a six, four to six gig in size, the millions of sectors. As you create a one million entry array for every every block, uh, every file, probably not. Okay, that's going to waste a lot of space on this. So how do you come up with a better organization okay, that will allow us to grow and shrink? So one, one suggestion was you have to grow the structure dynamically. Okay. That is basically the one that we are going to pick, but we are going to grow it in a different way. Okay, so we already did the advantage and disadvantage. So, so rather than growing it in one layer, we are going to make the organization multi-level. We are going to be smart because we want to support small and large files. We are going to treat them slightly differently. Okay, so this is what your multi-level index node looks like. This is basically what a traditional Unix file system does. Yeah, that's very really HT2 or things like that. Okay. Uh, TXT3 is a log structure as a log organization, which is slightly different, but in the exit to all file system look like. Okay, so this is your file descriptor. Okay. So it has, uh, typically it has 14, so this is 14 entries. Okay. The first 10 entries are, uh, uh, let me even learn. Uh, okay, so let's just go with this, they're slightly different than your file system. So there are 14 block pointers. The first 12 entries here directly point to disk blocks. Okay, so, so the first 12 blocks, you just read the file descriptor, you read these addresses, and you're done. Okay? If your file grows to a 13th block, 
then what you are going to do is we are going to allocate another disk block that is an extension of the index node. Okay. So you basically store an entry, a pointer to this block, and this block will actually have pointers to this block. Okay. This is called the first level indirect block. Okay. So these are direct pointers. This is one level indirection. Okay. So this is basically a one level indirect. So this is basically, a, let's say, a five. 112 bytes, so you can store maybe 500 depending on the block size, up to 1000 entries here. Now, if your file size grows to more than 1024 plus 12 blocks, okay, you will use the 14th entry here and you will allocate another disk block. And this will have two levels of indirection. So, this will basically you will allocate the first entry, which will be a secondary indirect, and this will have pointers to data blocks. So it's a multi-level index. The early, the first few blocks are direct pointers. Okay, the next one zero two four blocks are one level indirect. The next one zero two four square blocks are two level of indirect. Okay. Typically, file systems have a triple level indirect because even this is not sufficient. So you will have fifteenth entry here. So if you grow beyond this size, you are going to have one more entry that points to an index block that itself points to another index block that points to yet another one. Three levels of information. Okay. So you may ask why complicated this way? What did we gain? Yes. Accessing any random um, block is at roughly log time, log the size of the number of index files you have? Okay. Accessing something takes log times the number of levels. That's fine. My question was somewhat even simpler. Why have this complicated optimization? Okay, are there better ones? Why not do what was suggested, which is just have a linked list of these point of these index nodes? Okay, why did we go about doing this? Is, is it because so um, so the system can like expand the uh, expand the hard the size of the hard drive like in the future? Is it because the system can expand so, the so size can, of the like, We want to expand the size of the file. Yeah. Okay, not necessarily the hard disk, but of the file, and we'll see why that this organization has just So this gives you a good compromise because if you have a really small file, um, you're already set up, and your file descriptor doesn't take up much space. Um, and yet, if you have a really, really big file, if we're going to use a linked list of, of 14 block, 14 pointer blocks and I want the, the 2 millionth block of the file. In order to find the pointer to the 2 millionth block of the file, I'm going to have to go through a lot of 14 pointer blocks. By using this structure, you get it, like he said, in, in log instead of um, linear. So you get much better performance with big files. So this organization is trying to strike a compromise between providing good performance for small files and reasonable performance for large files. Okay? This is like doing progressive taxation. As files grow larger, you pay slightly more overhead. And just as you grow richer, you pay slightly more tax. Same kind of scenario. Okay? So if you have small files, the first 12 blocks are direct pointers. Okay? So, so until your sub file is, is, is less than or equal to 12 blocks in size, you have no real extra overhead. You just read the file descriptors and the addresses are right there and you can just go and access any of those blocks sequentially or in random. Okay. If your file grows bigger than that, you pay an overhead, which is I have to read yet another block that stores the next 1024 addresses. Okay. So for files that are up to 1036 blocks in size, you actually have to read Two levels, you have two levels of one level of indirection. You need a file descriptor, you need another index node, and then you read this address. File grows a little more than that, you go and basically start allocating one more block. Okay. And then as the file grows, you keep adding these blocks. Okay. Two levels of indirection. And then, as I said, in real file system, you have a three level indirect. Okay. The third level of indirection, you have one more entry here that will basically have three levels of indirect. So as the file grows, you are going to have to have a little more overhead, but the overhead is still not growing very substantial. You have to access at most three disk blocks here to get to the data block you care about. The file descriptor, the first level, the second level, and the data itself. In three disk IOs, you can get to any bl random block in this structure. <coughs>
at most three disk cards. The file is smaller than it is either one disk I/O here or this plus this or some such thing. Is that clear? And the other advantage is you don't need to know the file size a priori. The amount of disk space you allocate to the file descriptor also grows with the size of the file. So initially you'll have only one file descriptor. As the file grows beyond the twelfth block, you'll have this sector and this sector allocated for the metadata. As you grow beyond this, you'll have this, this, and this, and maybe one of these, and so on and so forth. So you don't have to allocate this gigantic array up front with all sparse entries that date. The descriptor itself grows with the file. Are we representing directories as file descriptors in this case? Are we representing directories as file descriptors? As we will see, we haven't talked about what is in the data file. You can actually, the file could be a, a real file or a directory. Every directory or a file will have an index node that will look exactly like this. If a directory could grows, which means the number of entries in the directory grows, you will grow similarly. Okay, so the index node can handle directories, and directories are just special files that contain names of other files. Okay, is that clear? Okay. So, so what is the maximum file limit in this case? So can you only have two levels? Let's, well, as I said, in reality, there's a third level, but let's just take this simple organization as a two levels. Okay, so if you have two level uh, index, multi-level index. Is that the block size? Yeah, the number of blocks. So you, you asked what was the number of blocks or the number of the size number of the file? Maximum number of blocks that can oh, be in the file. Yeah. So, so how many direct block pointers do we have? Well, direct block pointers, which are the pointers to direct data blocks. The first level is direct. This one. It's one ten twenty four. Okay. Let's say this is a four kilobyte block. So each pointer takes let's say four bytes. <coughs> one zero two four. Okay. So okay. So let's say you use that up. Then now you are in two level in there. Okay. How many blocks you can you accommodate? How many addresses can you accommodate in this structure? Ten twenty four square. And if you have a third level indirect, you basically have 1024 Q. So if you just have this file descriptor which have 15 entries, you can store a maximum file size that's that large. Okay. That times the block size, that many bytes. And as you can imagine, that's large. So not that large, but it is large. Two gigabytes just to be the file limit for a reason. So, so you can accommodate fairly large files. Yet performance for small files is very good. If you have one two kilobyte files, you'll have file descriptor with a couple of entries, okay, and those will have very good performance. Okay. Linux file systems actually go one step further. If you have very small files, files that are less than ten bytes in size. They don't even allocate a disk block. They actually store those contents here. But if you create an empty file or a file with one byte in it, you actually store that data here. So you just read the file descriptor and the data is already there. And that's an optimization. And mostly used only in the question. So when you need a file, if you know what the size is, you know to which index to Yes. So the way it would work is basically if I say that uh, the question is, how are you addressing the file? If I say go to block i, right, you'll basically say, if i is less than or equal to 12, just look at one of these entries and you're done. Okay? So that's how you dereference blocks 1 through 12. If you have blocks 13 to 1, 0, 3, 6, okay, you say go read up the 12th block or the 13th address that points to this block, go read that and then find whichever one you care about here, and that gives you the address. If you have 1037, 1024 square, then basically you go down this path. Okay, so you go 
take that and you go read this, find the right entry here, you go read that and so on. So, so random access is still fairly simple. Yeah, you know exactly where to go. Yeah, you might have to have at most four disk IOs to get to any block, which is still not that bad. Yeah, much better than a linkless organization, where yeah, you have to scan in blocks to get to the end block. Any other questions here? Okay. So, advantages we did all that already. It's a simple to implement. It's not that simple. Supports incremental file growth. Yes. Small files are efficiently supported. Yes. Indirect access is somewhat inefficient to very large files, but not is growing at uh, logarithmically, not linear. Yeah. So that's still not bad. Yeah. So and. There is going to be seeks are still going to be n seeks because uh, if you want to read n blocks are scattered all over disk, and so you're still going to are not contiguous. So you still have n. Okay. File size is bounded. That's the bound depending on the number of indirects you have. Okay. So you could do some optimizations to improve performance further, and these optimizations are basically going to say when you try to allocate, although you are not constrained or required to allocate blocks contiguously, you try to do that to get better performance. <coughs> if you want to allocate two blocks, try to find them close to, so such that they're close to one another on the physical disk. So in that case, if you try to read the file sequentially, you can read those blocks quickly. You don't have to have long seeks between blocks. Okay. So you have optimizations called extends where you allocate multiple blocks of the file all at once contiguously just to save on IO performance. So you try to do this, and they are not required. If you, do, if you have a def, uh, highly fragmented disk, you can keep your data anyway. But if you have mostly empty disk, you can get good performance by clustering blocks of the file close to one another on a disk. Okay, that way, the number of seeks is actually going to be lower. So if you have this kind of a disk, so you store the blocks as close to one another. So when you seek from one to another, they are very small seeks, so you don't actually pay a high cost. So by clustering this data, you can actually get better performance. That's an optimization. That's not a requirement. Okay, so that's what the OS could do to get better performance. Okay, so we are going to skip this because we have to do the exam review. So I'll come back to the last couple of slides later. Okay. So we are going to switch gears. I'm going to talk about the next exam. As I said, if some of you came in late, there is a sample exam on Moodle. We go take a look. Material for the exam is deadlocks and memory management. Okay. That is lectures 10 to 15. Okay. Memory management overflowed into the 16th lecture. There are two slides in lecture 16. I think actually maybe three. Okay. The first two or three slides. I'm just an overflow. I couldn't finish it. That's all. That's the last couple of slides of memory management. Don't forget that. Essentially, material like this uh, from lectures 10 to 15, but there's a tiny bit of overflow into lecture 16. So please take that into account as well. Okay. That's the material. Okay. Same kind of arrangement as last time. Evening exam in this room starts at 7 on Thursday. Okay. One and a half hours like before. Okay, closed book, closed notes, okay. and uh, go, as I said, there is no, no lecture on Thursday. I and mean, we have office hours, I'd send you email about that, but let's do a review. Okay, so, dialogues, that's uh, we need to, this is all the stuff. So, as I said, the same strategy as last time would be uh, advisable, which is start with the slides that I have. Make sure you know the material on the slides. Things that are not on the slides, but in the book, you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So start with the material on the slide. There are some notes we have provided. You look at the notes, then go look, review what is in the book yeah, to get a better understanding. Okay. Don't start reading chapter equivalent chapters in the book and do it. Probably you will read a lot of material that's not relevant for the exam. Okay. It may be relevant to operating system, but not for the test. Okay. All the concepts, just quick review, you need to know what is a dialogue. How does it differ from starvation? It's a condition where a set of threads or processes are waiting on a whole some resources are waiting on one another for other resources. Nobody can make progress. Okay. That's basically the definition of a deadlock. 
and it looked at four necessary conditions for a dagger. Okay, you need to know what those four conditions are. Okay. So, mutual exclusion, hold and weight, circular, uh, circular uh, weight. I am going to post this material on the class web page shortly. I wanted to do the review and then post. That's why we did three kinds of techniques for dealing with deadlocks. Uh, deadlock prevention, deadlock detection, deadlock avoidance. Okay. So we said in one case, and they vary in terms of what we are trying to achieve. The simplest thing is you put some constraints on how the applications are written or how they use resources and make one of the four necessary conditions false. If one of the four necessary conditions is false, there will never be a deadlock. That's guaranteed, so the system doesn't have to do it. That's one approach. The other two approaches involve uh, don't put any restriction, but then try to deal with deadlocks at runtime. Okay? One says when as requests come in, we will check what requests are being uh, asked for and see if that will result in a circular weight, and if so, we deny that request. Okay? That's called deadlock prevention. The last one says I will not do any checks even at runtime. We we'll just, just let processes run, threads run as they want, and we will try to deal with deadlocks after they occur. So we'll wait for a deadlock to occur, we'll run some cycle detector and say, here are some threads that are deadlocks, and we'll terminate them. Okay? So you can deal with deadlocks when you write the application, you can deal with deadlocks when you run the application, you can deal with deadlocks after your applications are dead. Okay? So spectrum of techniques. You need to understand all the differences between all of those things. Okay? Uh, we looked at deadlock detection in more detail by looking at resource allocation graphs. Okay, these are graphs that tell you what threads exist in the system, what resources exist, which thread is holding what resources, and who has requested other resources. Okay? This, uh, this graph gives you a good depiction of all the, the current state of the system, and typically you try to not allow requests that will result in cycles. Okay? So you want to ensure that cycles are not present, and that's a good way to ensuring that deadlocks will not happen. So if a request comes in, and granting that request caused results in a circular uh, the cycle because this is a directed graph, then you deny that request. Okay? That basically leads to the concept of a safe state. A safe state is one in which you know there is no deadlock and all the resource, all processes can finish execution. Okay? We looked at this algorithm called Banker's algorithm. Somewhat painful, but yet a al good al general algorithm to figure out whether to grant a request or not depending on whether the system state is safe or not. Why painful? Painful to work out. More painful to do. <laughs> so we did all these exercises where I was talking about needs matrix, allocation matrix, and I think I lost most of the class. That's yeah. so why it was painful to me. <laughs> so that part of the resource allocation graph? It is part of the resource allocation graph. This is a general algorithm that deals with arbitrary number instances of resources, etc. You don't actually have a graph. You just deal with things in terms of matrices. Right? So, so the graph is there. It's implicit. But you can just code that up so just by looking and manipulating matrices. Right? So that's basically the way uh, you deal with the bankers. Would, would the bankers, would that be a, 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 an avoidance? Algorithm. Banker's algorithm is same as this one. Yeah, this is it's a generalization of this. Yeah. And because these are all running at runtime. Requests come in, you say, should I grant this request or not? If I grant this request and you go to unsafe state, you may need to attack you. Yeah, it's a runtime algorithm, not something that runs after the fact. Okay. So that's deadlocks. Okay, then we have a sex slew of lectures on memory management. So we studied all of these schemes, relocation, contiguous allocation, paging, segmentation, page segmentation, demand paging, and virtual memory. Okay? So you need to understand that whole spectrum of sleep. Okay? So I'm going to slice it and dice it slightly differently. Okay? So for each of those strategies, you need to understand how address translation works. Okay? Given a logical address, how is a physical address derived? What data structures are maintained? 
that are, they are based on limit register, space tables, segment tables, segment registers, what are these uh, data structures and how NTL means of course and how do you do this translation efficiently. Yes. I was going to have to work out an average. I know I did this example like 4 kilobytes and 10 kilobytes. Speeds of address translation. We need to understand how TLBs actually help. We create this analysis called effective memory access, which says the TLB iterate is a certain value, and those are that's the fast part. You just look up the TLB, you're done. And if you get a TLB miss, you go to the actual page table in memory, and then you get this uh, analysis of what is the effective memory access. You need to understand all of that. Okay? As far as contiguous policies are concerned, fragmentation is an issue. We need to understand what is fragmentation. How do all of these processes, uh, not processes, strategies, which ones have fragmentations, which ones don't? Okay, so I think the ones that segmentation has fragmentation and relocation and contiguous allocation of fragmentation. The rest don't. Okay, anything that is paged will not have fragmentation. Okay. Ability to grow processes, share memory with other processes, ability to move processes. How do all of these schemes perform along these dimensions? Uh, how, what do you do for memory protection, okay, limit registers, out of range addresses and page tables and so on and so forth. Okay. Context switches, okay, what state needs to be saved and what state needs to be restored. Page tables, TLDs and segment tables, that kind of stuff. Okay, so, okay, this should be that my answer to question. You want a request for memory determine how it can be supported using contiguous allocation, given virtual addresses, find the corresponding physical address. Okay, this kind of stuff you need to understand and how to do. Okay, that's what you're asking. Uh, so we are quickly review these policies. Contiguous allocation is started with static and dynamic relocation. Okay. Static relocation just assumes that you basically stick the process in memory, it never moves, and typically it starts at address zero. Okay? Mostly used for uni program. Okay? If you have multiple processes loaded in memory at the same time, <coughs> you need to load the processes at different regions in memory and use a base and limit registers to do the address translation. So you take the logical address, which is with respect to the start of that process, okay? that's called an offset, and then you add it to the base register that gives you the physical address. Okay, so that is basically how dynamic should be relocation, not allocation. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's how dynamic relocation is going to do its address translation. Okay, so your best and there is a limit register. As far as allocation strategies go, you are doing contiguous, so there's going to be fragmentation. And we said there are multiple ways to do this. We have holes which are free space and memory, so you can look for the best fit for a given process, the first fit for a given process, but the worst fit for a given process with respect to the size of the board. Okay, so you need to know what these policies do. Okay. So that's a simple policy. The more complex ones involve paging or segmentation or combination of the two, segmented paging. Okay. So paging basically says you will allocate memory in fixed size chunks called pages. You will take a process chop it up into pages, take memory, chop it up into frames of the same size and allocate pages to frames. You are no longer requiring that pages are stored continuously. The pages can be stored anywhere, so you are going to keep a table called a page table with pointers to memory. So as you see today, in today's class we looked at file descriptor, it was acting in the same way as page table. That stores pointer to disk blocks, page table stores pointers to memory blocks, the same thing. In either case, we have the, the, the process of the file to be continuous. So we need to, we look, talked about where are page table stored. So you could put it in registers, but you don't have enough of them, so typically not a good idea to store it in memory, in the kernel memory. And there it can <coughs> arbitrary size page tables. Yeah, but the problem is you have doubled the ac uh, number of accesses to dereference a memory address. First, I have to go to the page table in memory, read it, and then you look at the page table entry, and then you go to the page. Okay, so you use a TLB to speed up these memory accesses, 
PLB is a cache for the page table, an associative cache for the page table. Okay, this is going to speed up your effective memory access time. So that's paging. There are some paging in like two minutes. And then we talked about another scheme called segmentation. So I think this is where lots of people are missing from the class. So we go be sure to go and review this material carefully. Segmentation is the compiler's view of a process. So process now it doesn't have pages, it has segments, code segment, text segment, deep segment, and you allocate memory for each of the segments independently. Right? Segments can be of arbitrary size, so this is going to lead to the same fragmentation problem. Yeah? But the way you dereference it, the addresses are segment ID and an offset within the segment, rather than a page number and an offset within the page. Yes. You said it's the compiler's view? Compiler or the processor's view, yes. So, when a compiler generates machine code, it will assume that there is a code segment as a stack and a heap. And it's going to address the regions appropriately. Right? So OS doesn't directly care. The OS only looks at the address space. Right? It's not a really agnostic. Right? Segment tables can also be stored in registers, if you want, or base and limit registers particularly. So that's really how we are going to do this. So sorry, you back that. Um, are the segment tables created by the compiler or are they created by the operating system to refer to? So the way we will do is the segment tables are created by the OS. Okay. Remember that the compiler always is going to generate a logical address, which is an integer. Which right. is basically, the compiler thinks of this as one layout. Okay, this may be the heap, this may be the stack, this may be the code segment. So it is just going to address it from zero down. Mm -hmm. When the OS is concerned, it will take this address, which is this integer, to a particular word here, and it will extract the segment ID and the offset by just looking at the integers. That makes sense, but if the if it's the compiler that's deciding where to put the segments within the logical memory space, <coughs> the operating system that's deciding how to break it up into pieces, how does the operating system know where the compiler put the bound segment boundaries? How does the OS know where the segment boundaries? So the stack and the heap are going to go to grow dynamically. Okay. Heap, the compiler will not know anything about it. It's just going to use pointers. They are going to get dereference at runtime. Okay. So, so the heap is going to be there with completely at runtime. The stack you can actually figure out. You know, once you call a function, you allocate a new stack frame, mm -hmm. and then you say these are the three-way parameters, this is the return value, so the stack is actually going to go. So you can use the stack pointer and address the variables of the stack. Okay. Yeah, so the compiler will have to generate appropriate addresses for parameters, for instance, that are actually going to be on the stack. It has to address them mm -hmm. in the machine code. And it is going to use this view to address them. The compiler has to then translate the compiler. The OS has to translate it at one time into a particular segment, which is a stack and an offset in that segment. Okay. You may not know the exact sizes. That is by the limit of the stack. But you don't know the offset, at least for the stack. The heap is going to be completely dynamic. Okay. But that's taking us into the realm of compilers, not necessarily OS as of how compilers actually generate code and how they address variables and things like that. It just as you said, this go into registers and this stay in stack and so on and so on. Okay, that's a time. We don't have to know about what I just said here as far as OS is concerned, but it's a good thing to know that in order to understand segmentation better. Okay. So very quickly, uh, we talked about combining segmentation and paging, but segmentation has external fragmentation. We said, why not page the segments? Okay, so now we have multiple data structures. There's a segment table, and there's a page table for every segment, and then page tables point to pages within that segment. Okay. And that basically allows you to retain the compiler's view of the process, which is all these segments, and the OS's view of the process, which is it doesn't care what is in it, it just wants to page them, because that's the way it avoids fragmentation. Okay. Demand paging is where basically the next scheme we looked at, and this is where we relax the assumption that the entire process be resident in RAM. We allow processes to, a single process to be bigger than RAM, 
And we also allowed the total size of all the processes to far exceed the size of it. And we did this by using this as a masking stone for RAM. Okay? And that basically says we are going to fetch pages on demand from disk into RAM. Every time you touch a page that's not recipient in memory with a page fault, then you go into a page fault and see, and then you fetch the page and resume execution. So you need to know what a page fault is, how it is serviced, and how you resume execution. Then we talked about page replacement algorithms, because whenever a page comes in, on a page fault, some page gets erected. Then we looked at schemes to do this, IFO, First come, first serve, first in, first start. Win, which is an optimal policy. It actually requires knowledge of the future. So you have it to pay that is uh, going to be accessed the fastest in the future. Okay? Optimal but not practical. Okay? Because you don't know the future. Okay? Unless you are Oracle, which is not the company, but Oracle as in something going in the future. Okay? So MRU is a policy that approximates min by just looking at the, the recent past. Okay? You assume past is a good predictor of the future. And you can evict the page that was accessed the farthest in time. Okay? And we spent an entire lecture that tried to look at implementation aspects of LRU. Okay? We said LRU sounds like a good policy, but it is notoriously difficult to implement. Okay? So we looked at various ways to implement LRU, and they were all very expensive. So we said we cannot actually implement this in practice with good performance. So we looked at approximation. We looked at two such approximations. Second chance and enhance second chance. Okay, we saw some other ones where <coughs> you have fewer bits to approximate time stamp and so on. Okay. Second chance policy uses a one bit time stamp to, to partition pages into young and old, two groups. Pages that are in use and pages that are old. And if you need to evict, you just go to the old group and you evict. And you use a single bit that you can actually store on the, either the page table or on the TLB to figure this out. So do go and review all of that material. That was another class where I think the attendance wasn't uh, very good. But uh, still go review the test. Yeah, so as far as uh, LRU is concerned, we talked about two kinds, global LRU per process. Okay, global LRU, you take all the pages of all processes, put them on one single list, and you always evict the least recently used page. Okay, so processes are competing for memory. One process can evict another process's page. So you don't get memory isolation. But you can dynamically go and grow and shrink processes by evicting the appropriate page. In per process, you basically always evict your own page. Your per process LRU list, to evict a page, you evict your least recent used page, not somebody else's page. Right? And then we talked about thrashing and how do you do working set computations using temporal locality. Okay, we talked about spatial locality and temporal locality of reference in the context of the 90-10 rule. Okay, so you need to understand what 90-10 rule is, what is the working, uh, what is spatial and temporal locality. The okay, last concept is what is the working set. Okay, this is the set of pages the process is actively working on. The basic point is if you are not even given enough memory to allocate to accommodate your working set, the process is going to page fault a lot. Okay, so all memory allocation schemes must try to at least give a process these many pages. That is working set size. And so that's basically it. So we talked about thrashing. And the last uh, sort of point was how do you determine the page size? And what happens for large pages, small pages, has implications on the size of the page table and the, uh, uh, the overheads of page faults. And the larger the pages, a, page, a single page fault gets over amortized across more memory instruction. Okay, so you want to balance these trade-offs. Okay, as far as problems are concerned, we have done a sequence of these for replacement algorithms, given us a reference stream and some number of frames. You need to figure out what pages are resident in memory, what access is due to page fault, and so on. Okay. The last point I forget is we talked about this notion of Bellady's anomaly. Okay, this is a problem where as we, if you increase the memory allocation of the process, it performs worse. Okay, so that's fast. So when you have techniques like FIFO, the page fault rate actually goes up rather than down. Okay, so you need to know what you need to know what value is and what is. So I'm going to stop in a couple of minutes over the time limit here. So I will stop. As I said, I will have office hours tomorrow and.
Thursday. No questions.